Okay, everybody. Uh, we're going to start with our first talk for today, uh, in which Senad is going to talk about uh, busting advanced botnets. There you go. Okay, so good morning. Uh, I can see that Rakia has a huge impact, right? I mean, people are still sleeping. Okay, so my name is Senat and I'm based in Amsterdam. So today I want to speak about my uh, research articles. There is a lot of them. So basically what I do in my free time, I used to do this professionally when I used to work in Italy. So we were going against the botnets and we were trying to take them down. Uh, so I just uh, choose uh, three, four of the most uh, advanced ones, right? So we all know the botnets, but how advanced they are, we really don't uh, do too much research on that side. So I know there is a lot of colleagues like me, uh, freelancers or individual researchers that are doing this kind of stuff. But believe me, uh, the, the advanced level of the botnets are really, really uh, high right now. I mean, they're really complex. So. Agenda for uh, today, I'm going to be very short. Uh, I have two demos, very short ones. I hope that you guys can see it from here. So I'm going to speak, first of all, uh, the most annoying question for the cybersecurity operations. Are we, are we affected? Why are we affected? Then we're going to see how to locate the evil. Uh, and then we're going to sniff in or peek in into the CryptoLocker Command and Control Center, uh, man in the middle, uh, builder Command and Control Center. This is really cool. And then we're going to speak about the NAS, Network Attached Storage, from QNAP, uh, how they uh, uh, infected the machines, then they put them to the botnet. Then we're going to speak about the KINs. This botnet and this malware is really unique. It's, it's better than my real e-banking application, okay? It has better functionalities. And then we're going to speak about the second factor, how they, how they are enough to protect our personal information, and especially for the credit card information and transactions. And then we're going, I'm going to show you guys the most advanced botnet so far that I managed to capture. Uh, and I'm going to share you the source code of this botnet so you guys can play with it. And then we're going to go with the conclusion. Uh, about myself, so I burn in ex-Yugoslavia, okay? Then I grew up in Macedonia, and right now we call it Northern Macedonia, okay? <laughs> so currently living in Amsterdam, but you know all these uh, Southeastern Europe countries, like I mean most in Balkans, we call ourselves, like, we are from Balkans, right? So that's easier to, to explain. Well, I start very early, so Commodore 64 was one of my first PC. I remember that time we had a uh, it was a very strange, so we had a, some kind of uh, club where we were pushing, they were pushing, actually, I was too young at that time, uh, Commodore games and, and some, I don't know, text and stuff like, stuff like that from the FM radio, right, basically. So we were recording on the magnetic tapes and they were, they, we were playing the programs and games on the, on the Commodore 64. By the way, I'm 40 years old, so for that reason, <laughs> when I speak, don't think that... So uh, then, uh, yeah, one of my first hacks was the diverted internet. So in Macedonia at that time, when they started to push an internet, it was really expensive. It was around five or six Deutsche Marks per one hour. And we had these expensive dial-in numbers, the premium ones. But what was the strange thing is that when you were applying for a number change, they were not terminating the whole number. So what I done, I applied for diverting the number, and I diverted my home number to a premium internet number. and then. I went to the post office and I said, okay, I don't like this number, I want to change it. And they give me a new number and the old number stayed remain on the divert to the internet. So uh, it, my home number was in news everywhere. I think that we made a million at that time. Everybody was dialing in a local a fee and then after free dials it was diverting to the internet, which was really expensive, but we didn't pay anything so that time. Yeah, 2007, you still can Google it, one of my first public hacks, it was iPhone, so using Simplon method. Yeah, it was a uh, huge uh, noise that time. Uh, then I started to go against the botnets professionally and individually and like a hobby. And yeah, one of my last hacks was a Vodafone Netherlands. So basically what they do is they limit us. We cannot put this modem on a bridge mode, but there is a privilege escalation. So with a privilege escalation, using a guest account, and they hide the CSS, the bridge button. So I managed to do that. They sent me a flowers, 
and they enable a lot of free uh, pay-per-view channels to me, but it was cool. Yeah, I am a big fan of Metallica. This is from the last concert in Amsterdam, okay? So, let's go, uh, the first thing, are we affected? I used to work in cybersecurity operation centers, like a threat hunter, instant responder, um, a team lead. Now I am building them. So maybe you guys heard about the biggest airport in the Istanbul. Uh, so I was the chief architect for the World Cybersecurity Operation Center there. So basically, I'm coming from that kind of background. And you know, the most annoying question in the morning was when a manager was showing up and saying, hey guys, did you saw the news? Are we affected, right? That's the only thing they do. I mean, they show up in the morning and they say, hey, you, did you guys saw the news? Are we affected, right? So let me just show you from a simple threat intelligence platform how we can come up to this question, are we affected? So what I'm going to do, I will go just to the WannaCry. I will, I will check the Talos block. By the way, I work for Cisco, so I don't expect me some Cisco demos, okay? Just classical stuff. Uh, and then I'm going to copy my IOC's indication of the compromises, right? So as you can see, I copied a bunch of IOCs, and I'm going to tell to my threat intelligence platform, hey, what do you know about these IOCs, okay? So this platform is actually correlated to an external threat intelligence and internal one, what is happening on your environment, okay? So I just searched around 43 indication of the compromises. I'm going to remove this one, it's making so sound here, hitting the table. And then, yeah, are we affected, right? So right away I can tell that one of my machines is already affected, okay? So this is the back-to-back -back integration. This is something that every company needs to build today. So the wall cybersecurity technologies, they need to connect to each other. They need to share threat intelligence. They need to share context, events to each other, right? So it's coming, 40.25. So let me just uh, wait this one to finish. I, I'm sure that you, we all know Maltego, right? <laughs> well, I call this like Maltego in muscles uh, because it's using a huge cloud power behind and the wall threat intelligence that you can collect. Of course, again, uh, this is uh, this is the one of the one of the uh, let's say most integrated platform that you can that you can play with it right now. So here we go. Yeah, all 43 IOCs search in one single uh, action. So basically, just copy paste, right? Now I can see that I have two machines infected. I want to jump to one of my machine here, and as you can see. Uh, all those arrows here, that context actually, is telling me, hey, this machine is targeted by this file, and this file is parent of this file here, and this bad file is uh, again parent of this file, or is executed by this bad, bad file. So basically, you can go to the root cause, seeing who is executing who, and who is ha attacking my machines, right? So this famous answer, are we affected? Yes, we are affected. But we are not stopping here. So the first thing what I do every morning, and I'm sure that everybody does, right, is going to Twitter and checking the OpenDIR hashtag. OpenDIR hashtag is actually uh, uh, researchers who are publishing all zero-day findings uh, regarding their researches, okay? So basically, as you can see, everybody is publishing uh, CNC information, so zero-day malware, malware which doesn't have any disposition and stuff like that. So you are reading, right? So I'm reading the news. Maybe I'm in the restroom right now, right? Sitting and reading my news every day. <laughs> and then, yeah, you know, like a security guy, like a guy who used to work in socks, I'm asking myself right now, hey, is any of those uh, non-detected or fresh zero day indication of the compromises in my company, okay? So I'm affected of all of this file, this information that I am reading here. So it contains IP addresses, domain name, SHA-256, anything can be IOC. There is a simple button. If I click the button here, the threat response, what we're going to do is going to grab all the IOCs from the patch page that I just scrolled down. So it's done. I have the all IOCs that I was reading on my news, and I'm going to say, hey, I am affected from those IOCs, and here we go. So from one single button, I can see if I am affected or not. Okay, so this is helping a lot in threat hunting. Yes? Can you please explain what we're asking here, what this platform is? This is, uh, this is threat intelligence platform. Sorry? The threat intelligence platform. Ah, okay. Yeah, but the trick here is that the button here actually is copying all the IOCs from the web page source, and it's coming to your environment, and it's analyzing. You say, I just analyzed 2424, and I am not affected. 
So basically, if I want to see if, let's say, IP address, right? This IP address here, CNC server, it's on my own environment. What I do? I go to my next-gen firewalls and next-gen IPSs, right? And I'm searching that one, right? But what will happen if I have 25 of them? So this is the cool thing where you click a button, and then it's extracting all the IOCs, as you can see here, automatically from the web page. It can be your technology, or it can be open synth, or whatever it is. And then I automatically query my all endpoints, all my email gateways, network gateways, proxy gateways, and I s figure right, right away if I am affected or not. So as you can see, I don't have any hits so far, but I know that a lot of them are bad, unknown, and non good. Now, coming back to my slides. So, you know, uh, this are we affected question is really, really uh, fast right now to answer it. So why we are affected, right? So that's, that's a cool thing, right? We all have an AV and stuff like that, you know? Why we are getting hacked every day, even we have all these expensive next gen, next gen, next gen devices, right? The, sim the reason is very simple, because defense in depth is broken. Why is broken? Because defense in depth works in very, very basic ways, actual, actual application whitelisting, right? So I know what is good, based on this position, and I'm going to allow them to get came in. I'm going to block what I know what is bad, right? Did you guys ever seen a zero-day or unknown malware, which is a non-good, or which is a non-bad, right? So then it's not a zero-day, right? So the unknown files are actually penetrating the whole defense in depth strategy that we are putting in our own companies, and they are uh, pushing everybody to end up hacked or compromised, okay? So again, these unknown files are making defense in depth broken. For that reason, we need to have something which can deal with the unknown files. So uh, let's go and locate the evil, actually. So as you remember, I made, uh, yeah, I searched my uh, wall, em uh, wall endpoints here, right? So one of my machines, as you can see here, is affected by the WannaCry. I want to go and see what happened with this machine when WannaCry got hit. So I'm going to jump to the device trajectory, which is actually an ADR, right? We all know ADRs. I don't care which one you're going to use, but you need to have something like this. So basically, I want to go back in the time right now. I'm going to scroll down. Whoop, you guys are not seeing this. I'm not sure why, because it's like this. Yep, so I'm going to back now. So what I've done, actually, I, I went to my affect, infected machine here, and then I just opened device trajectory. Yeah, this is uh, anatomy of WannaCry. So basically, we can go back in the time, and we can see how WannaCry is infecting this machine. So I hope that you guys can see. I know that this one here has an issue. So as you can see here, a non-good process is dropping a lot of files. The plus button here is dropping a files, right? So it's dropping a lot of files here, as you can see, which doesn't make any sense, because uh, LSSX is not dropping a files, right? And then he's executing our files. This is a pure the, the eternal bull, uh, remote code execution. So right, so basically is forcing LSSX to drop files and to execute our files. So if I go in a time right now, so this is a time travel machine. So I want to scroll in the time and to see what is happening on this machine. So now I can see that he is running attribution exe to hide the files that he is dropping. So WannaCry is extremely, extremely smart. Okay, so he is hiding the files. And then he is running iCalls exe, and he is preparing read and write permissions because he's going to encrypt everything, right? So he dropped the files, he is hiding them, and then he is preparing the machine for for encryption. And look what is happening now. The encryption is happening. So moving, copying, moving. This is movement, right? So we can detect all kind of movements. I mean, any IDR can do this. That's it. And this is a real machine. It's not a sandbox, by the way. So copying done. What he is doing now? He is running Tor. OK, now he needs to exchange the keys, right? And then outbound connection to the Tor, the keys are exchanged, and for my, this machine is game over, right? The machine is hacked, and it's encrypted. And he's not stopping here, so basically he's deleting the shadow copies, right? So he's deleting the shadow copies and doing persistency with the register and stuff like that. So what we saw here actually was uh, infection anatomy, so how WannaCry is infecting all these machines. Now. Let's go to one of uh, 
uh, famous botnets that time. This was 2014. I agree, it's really 2013, actually, September. Uh, but it was one of the first uh, ransomware attacks in the world that time. So what was happening? There was an infection, pro infection process, right? So they use a PNG image with a VB, uh, Visual Basic code inside. Uh, they were using obfuscated, and actually this is very cool because they're using VimWorld and VSS admin to deliver the attack, right? And what they, why they do this is because VimWorld.x and VSS admin is a legitimate non good application at Windows, right? So nobody's monitoring them, no AV, no nothing, right? So this is the one way of, the, like right now PowerShell and WScript and other things are heavily, heavily, heavily used to compromise the machines. So uh, after we received the intelligence, we, get, get, uh, we, we went outside and we were chasing the botnets, so we managed to get inside. What we found inside is really amazing. So they have an admin portal, they have a user portal, uh, they have uh, all the settings about the botnet. So this is a botnet where you can rent a ransomware attack. Okay? Then what do you do? You define your countries, which countries you're going to target. This is all real data from the botnet, by the way. You define the amount, how much you're going to ask from your victims. You're going to define after amount, right? So you give me $10 in 10 hours, after that you're going to be in 20 hours, $20, okay? Or liter of, or liter of Rakia, right? I mean. <laughs> and then you choose the currency. You can, it can be any currency, right? So this uh, ransomware as a service was really powerful, basically, right? Then what you do? You go and you define your email for where you're going to receive the payments, store URL for the extension of the keys, the time how much you're going to give them, uh, decryption application, right? So you want to give them some sample decryption for free so they can be sure that they're going to receive their files back so you can do also this kind of stuff. Uh, your wallet ID where you're going to receive the bitcoins and IV vector, right? This is especially for against the, against the brute force attacks for your keys. What, what we had inside, so we found a lot of mails, we found a lot of SMTP uh, accounts, and we, we found a lot of errors. So they were keep, keep, uh, keeping a full Wikipedia for, for the errors, right? So they make sure <laughs> that there will be no problem during the infection phase, right? So inside of these folders, uh, we saw a lot of in victims. I mean, a lot of, lot of encrypted machines. What else we saw? 26,000. Victims, so there was, uh, so it was very cool. They have uh, Great Britain, Espania, Italy, and Netherlands email addresses, all pure targeted with their own local language, in their own geolocation, with their own currency. Everything was perfectly built. Uh, they had a help portal. Here we extracted a lot of people where they writing here like, hey, I pay you the money, where is my <laughs> files, right? So this is again another proof that paying to them is a problem. Or you're going to receive your money or not, right? So here is a people uh, which, you know, they never receive their files back even if they paid. So they keep this kind of help portal, right? So you can reach out to them. Some impact, so they collected $64,000 for a couple of days while this attack was hot, and then we didn't monitor them because we take down the CNC server, and then, you know, they come up somewhere else, but who knows where. Yeah, this was one of the, uh, uh, let's say, ransomware. Again, you know, we, we all seeing uh, the hype of ransomware attacks right now this year, so everybody thinks that, hey, there is a big money on ransomware, right? Well, yes, and... There is another story about ransomware, because do it, to deliver a ransomware attack, you don't need to be a top-notch developer, right? Because to, uh, to steal a credit, credit card information, you need to have a lot of things. You need to build a man-in-the-middle browser attack, you need to bypass the second factor, to steal the credit card information, you need to burn some zero days, uh, privilege escalations, and blah, 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 right? Right with the ransomware, you can just rent it for $100, and you can infect all your, all your family, right? If you need the money for, for some vacation, so. Uh, yeah, another one which was very interesting, uh, you know, sometimes we want to build a, a malware, right? But we don't know how to do it. I mean, as I mentioned you before, the dropper developer can be different, the payload different, the man in the middle browser attack guy who is doing that kind of stuff is different, right? And if you don't know how to do that, actually, you can go to this botnet here, and this is a wizard where you can click Next, next, next. And you can build your own man-in-the-middle browser attack plugin. <laughs> okay, so this is really important. So let me just show you. Here, basically, you're going to select which bank, what you want to do, which country, which operating system, which browser, et cetera, et cetera. And then what you do, actually, you are building your own man-in-the-middle browser attack, like in Lego. 
okay? So you choose what you want to show them. So here I can, you can see, you can choose, uh, I don't know, what to show, like attend to them, hold a login button. So as you can see here, you can hold them a couple of minutes in the app after you can, you can, you, you're going to steal in money and then you're going to forward them in a real bank. So basically, you don't need to be a really good guy or really good developer, right? A bad, bad good developer, let's put it this way, to develop CNC servers. I mean, you can rent them and then now you can still rent uh, many in the middle of browser attack. So again, you can, you can, you can push him to uh, a question, you can ask him something, you can for forward him to somewhere else, you can push him an error question, Java, hold, uh, error login, so you can kick him out, and then you can confirm that the transaction is done. So in place that you are pay paying your bills for electricity, but uh, in the background, actually, your money goes to somewhere else. And you don't see it, okay, because it's made in the middle of the attack, so it's game over. Again, this botnet was really, really, uh, I mean, granular. I'm going to s uh, share you guys slides because this is research article. So going every single step will take a long, long time. So I'm just trying to tell you guys the most important functions. But if you want to see deeper, then I'm going to share the link. Then you can see all the functionalities of this botnet. Yeah, next one. This was really cool, actually. Uh, <laughs> you know the shell shock, right? It's a huge. Uh, noise in the world, shell shock, shell shock attack. So basically, these QNAP uh, NAS devices, they got hit by a shell shock attack. <laughs> and what's the important thing here is that, which I really like, is like they do massive shell shock vulnerability scanning. And then they deploy the payload, and then they patch against the shell shock. So they, they want to make sure that they're going to own the device, but not somebody else, right? And then they're arming the uh, NAS device to doing the uh, uh, yeah, DDoS attacks, and then using that same NAS device to scan and hack other devices. So you can imagine. I mean, you just need to infect one NAS, QNAP, QNAP NAS device, network attached storage device, and then that one going to start hacking other QNAP devices. What we found inside, we found the first stage, so this is the uh, shell script, right? So basically it's, it's coming from this address here, it's going to the temp, and then it's executed. Here we have a second stage when actually the CGI script is coming in and is uh, entering a backdoor, right? So he's having another user on the machine, and then he's patching the machine. <laughs> this is really cool. And then he's moving to autopilot where he's starting to go and search and hack other QNAP devices. This was really unique. I mean, we, we informed QNAP, I think that they patched up for six months, I think. And uh, I still think that uh, there is a lot of IoT devices or this kind of NAS devices in the world. Uh, you can check it on, also on the showdown, which still is not patched against the shell shock attacks. So as you can see here, yeah, uh, uh, second stage, and then he's arming. Uh, inside of the second stage, actually, yeah, we extracted the, uh, the CJ script, and as you can see here, it has a dot. Well, this time, this was a DDoS, right? So what they do, you know, when you own 25, 30,000 of QNAP devices, right, so you can do whatever you want. You push a payload with a DDoS, you do DDoS, next day you push a payload for uh, man, Bitcoin mining, then you can push another payload, I don't know, whatever, whatever it is, right? So basically, you can, you can use them multiple times. Yeah, and then it installs another CGI backdoor, so basically you can control the QNAP device from anywhere in the world. How is my timing? Okay. Do I speak fast? I'm getting excited, and so stop me. So what about Keynes? I mean, <laughs> I like this one. You know, uh, I'm using uh, my e-banking application. Uh, <laughs> e-banking applications here in Balkan sucks. I know them, okay. So, uh, and some of the European banks, they also have I don't know, decent e-banking applications, but these guys here, they build a massive one. Let me just show you. So this is a malware from the Kins family with a CNC server, which is acting like an e-banking application. As you can see here, you have the victims, then you have how many money they have in their accounts, you can see the bot ID, and then you can see if the engine for stealing automatic money from them is starting or not. So you say like this, hey, I have, I don't know, 10,000 infected victims, go to them and grab only 10% of their money every month. Using pure money in the middle browser attack, the pure guy is paying every month their bills, but behind the money goes to the corks. But what do you do? Then you go 
and you define your crooks here. So who is the guy who's going to receive the money? The dropper guy, right? <laughs> Uh, his IBAN account, how much will be your split with him? 30, 50, or I don't know, 50, 50, or 70, 30. I mean, so you define your victims, you define how much money you're going to steal from the victims, you define who is the guy who's going to wash the money, right? We call them crooks. And it's full automatic. You just set up this and then the system works. So here's the crooks. Uh, here is, as you can see on the right side, but I'm going to show you again how much money they steal from the guys. Uh, they keep some very nice bug lists. So they, they, I mean, they monitor everything. If something is not working, they have a full lock system so they can fix the malware next time to be sure they're going to steal your money. And here you can design the guy. So he's going to Afghanistan. So his IBAN access, drop name, country. And here's the split, right? How much you're going to receive, how, and how much I'm going to keep to myself. So basically, <laughs> again, why they do this? Because, you know, when you infect 10 guys or 100 guys, you can control this kind of stuff, right, manually. But if you install thousands of people, you need to have an e-banking application like this in the background who are going to grab the money, share the money, drops, and stuff like that, okay? So again, this show us how advanced are those botnets, guys. I mean, it's not, I mean, it's not a joke, okay? We know, right? Botnets is okay, Stager, botnets is coming the payload, payload is doing some specific stuff, okay, that's it, game over. But when you get inside and you try to unlock their logic, then you're going to see they put a huge, huge investment and effort building this kind of stuff, okay? In full automatic. As you can see here, the drop's successful, so the money is delivered, the guy takes his own money, and he's sharing with the, with the hackers. Bad guys. So here is uh, actually, uh, this is drop transfer. So here you can put a transfer, how much you're going to steal from the guy and where the money will go. Now, let's see, let's speak about the second factor, right? Everybody thinks, yeah, I have a second factor and stuff like that. Well, second factor is not, uh, not a, I don't know, protection anymore. Also the tweet, CEO of the Twitter, right? Also his second factor got compromised with SMS, right? Late, 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 the latest news. So basically, bypassing second factor is very easy. There is a lot of fake applications, right? So when they do man in the middle browser attack, they know exactly which bank you are, and they going to push a man in the middle browser attack for your bank, and an AP key Android application for the specific bank, right? So you think that your bank is pushing your new uh, application for Android for e-banking. So you install, you set up the application in all normal way. You think that it's from your bank, but it's actually from the bad guys. Why? Because you're not aware that the, ba uh, the bank web application of the bank that you are accessing every day is actually not a real one, right? It's a man in the middle of the attack, and you see the render of the malware itself. So as you can see here, you define the second factor, and then you can grab all the second factors to do your dirty job, okay? To send money and do transactions. Now, we saw a lot of botnets, right? What about the most advanced one, which contains all of them? So this botnet has uh, automatic pilot, it has a man in the middle browser builder, it has a second factor, it has the malware samples inside. Everything is here, okay? So it starts with a web injects, right? So basically you define your web index and you're going to define which bank, which country you're attacking. And then it's starting. Right here you're going to define the second factor bypass. So what will be the number, which kind of uh, communication you want to make for them. And here is the application basically. So the system is building you the application with the logo of the bank and everything in it, right? So it's ready to, to trick all the customers of that bank that this application is legitimate. As you can see here, uh, yeah, after extracting the, the APK, we saw uh, uh, attack phone number. Yeah, I think that this is the elevator's number, okay? From the last night or, or not. <laughs> okay, so, and the SMS here, right? You can, you can build your SMS. There is a template in, in which kind of SMS. So back and forth, you are speaking with your customers, with your, well, with your victims actually, right? to grab their second factor, which is really, really, uh, I mean, advanced. And then we can, you can interact with them, right? You can forward them to another. Let's say, let's say that the guy, he changed his bank, right? Using the cookies, 
if, I mean, there is a mother who is checking the cookies and he says, hey, there is a new bank or a new guy or his father or his mother logged into the same machine with another bank account. Hey, there is a new bank. Do you want me to push a uh, man in the middle of a attack for that bank? And it's just full automatic, right? I mean, you, you configure once and the attack is going in full automatic manner. Yeah, so some conclusions. Look, I mean, we fight this guy along. Long, long. I mean, this was my day-by-day -day work for five years, okay? And then every time when we were catching them, they were becoming more advanced, okay? But what we learned from them is very amazing. So they use nearly always uh, shared hosting web servers. Why they do that? They do that because in sharing, sharing host web servers, sometimes we can, even, we can have a website which has a PHP MySQL, right? It can be WordPress or Joomla, something which can be prone to be compromised, right? And then there is a simple HTML website, right? Which there is nothing you can do technically, right? Even if there is, because there is no technical, I mean, there is maybe in the past, but I don't see uh, HTML vulnerabilities on the web application there that you can do something. What they do here is really, really smart. They hack into the web pages where the PHP and MySQL is installed. So basically, they leverage the web application platform behind. Uh, it can be WordPress or whatever it is. But they deploy the, the phishing kit on the HTML website. <laughs> okay, And then when we came in, we scanned the HTML website, and there is nothing inside that is vulnerable. So we were questioning ourselves, hey, how they managed to put this phishing kit on this website, but there is only HTML. <laughs> right? So they, they were doing this kind of tricks all the time. Uh, and then, you know, we, we, yeah, I mean, it, it didn't take too much time to figure out that, yeah, they are hacking. Uh, so basically, they have a root access to the whole server itself, and then they can just browse to the directories, and then they just, yeah, there is a HTML web page. Let's, let's put it here, because it's not, so, it's not so suspicious. Then what is happening? So this is really cool. So they have multiple phishing sites, OK? And all these phishing sites are sending hacked credit card information or personal personal information to these drop zones here, right? They were using curl, okay, in the background. Every single credit card information when you enter through the curl is pushing them to the drop zones. And then what we what we were doing, we were actually scanning those servers because there must be a vulnerability on the server. In 99.9%, they are using a vulnerable server servers to deploy their. Uh, stuff and they don't patch sometimes they don't care about it right so what we were doing we we're going against these vulnerable servers figuring out how they get inside what we are getting inside and we start blocking them so we start stealing their drop zone data and reporting to the police and they start getting angry with this okay because they collect a lot of data we get in we get in we collect the data they are not happy what they done they changed the strategy then they remove the drop zones, and they start using PHP mail functionality and using a Gmail account like a drop zone. <laughs> okay? And now it's a problem, because then we need to go and hack Gmail, right? And that will be not a good option. So we get pissed off, okay? For, because we were monitoring them a long time, around five months, and then they changed the way of their working. Then what will happen? We break in and we put a BCC to the fraudbank.com account. <laughs> and this is real. I can show you the data. So every single credit card that they were hacking, it was going to the Gmail of the guy. And then his BCC was going to the bank. The bank was killing the credit card. Again, it, can, it takes a couple of months until they figure out something else. And then they go again black. So again, we made them really, really mad, OK? So again, every time when we are pushing them, they are learning, guys. I mean, <laughs> look, we are, we are helping them to get to adopt more and more, let's say, skills and stuff like that. So I know that, uh, well, we don't build a botnets, right? But when we do, we run it on our computer. So this is the link of this, the source code of this botnet. Uh, we're going to share the slides, but you can, you can take a picture here. Uh, it's really cool. You can play with it. You can run it uh, with all droppers and stuff like that inside. Uh, maybe you can open your legal, uh, you know, I don't know, your own bank. I don't know, because it's 
much is, is so ready. Yeah, my other research articles, so basically there's a lot of them. Uh, I'm not doing in a couple of two years because of uh, heavily load that I have my current role uh, covering Northern Europe and Turkey alone. Uh, yeah, so thank you and questions. Oh, I went fast. Questions? Okay, so this last one, which you explained, is really uh, fascinating. So, of course, natural question is how do I check if my banking account has been compromised? Well, that's a good question. You need to check if your money is there or not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the biggest problem about the main individual broad strategy, and believe me, those attacks are on low because they are doing ransomware. I mean, if there is some silver bullet which, is, which will never came for ransomware, they're going to go back to this and they're going, because this was the only source for them, right? So the problem is that, well, me, you, we can realize, but the victims here was more, mostly people or fathers or mothers, the people who are, don't understand the essence of the security, right? And this can, this can take time for them to understand because this system, the ATS one, it was designed to steal 10% from them. So let me tell you something. Uh, uh, you know, we everybody do something, right? We do donations and stuff like that. I put a couple of donations, 10%, right? And I'm, and I'm receiving after six months an email from donations, hey, do you know that you donate 10% every month in, from your account, right? So we don't feel the 10%, 5%. That's the problem. So the problem here is that uh, if you are affected, if you are in many in the middle of attack, you, go, you are not going to feel this. The only way to feel this is to ask from your banking a paper statement and then to compare with your machine or to go... Uh, I don't know, in another machine or VM, install a VM, clean one uh, on the full, fully isolated and then log in to the, from that VM to your e-banking application and check if you see the same results or not. <laughs> That's the only way. I mean, if, if your AV is not stopping them, and believe me, AV will not going to stop them. Uh, uh, so my question, at one point you mentioned that you uh, BC, uh, BCC the hacked uh, credential car, uh, bank cards to the banks. How much logist uh, logistics was required for the banks to start automatically killing the uh, Nothing. It was cards? Yeah, bank gave us a very unique generate uh, email address from their SIM solution. So it was a random numbers and you know, very specific. So everything that was going there, a simple, I don't know, crawl and then just grab something and then just put them to the blacklist. It was really easy for them to do it. Thanks. Uh, I wanted to get your professional opinion uh, with the ransomware as a service, typically using RDP uh, as a vector. Uh, once that's fixed, do you see any other vectors that uh, ransomware as a service can use? Uh, sorry, I couldn't, get, I couldn't hear you well. So, ransom as a service yep. typically uses RDP. Okay. Do you feel that there's going to be other vectors that uh, ransom as a service can use for an attack and exploitation? You mean the remote desktop connection right. from Microsoft, right? I mean, look, there is, uh, I don't see the reason why they need to use the RDP, right? Because the aim of the one, okay, so let's put it this way. The classical malware we stealing your credit card information is, is silent. It must remain silent to be able to make his aim. Ransomware is opposite. <laughs> Did you ever seen a silent ransomware who is encrypting your files and not asking you anything? No. So they're going to ask something from you, OK? Uh, speaking about, you, you, wait, the question is for the RDP vulnerability right now, or? Right, the future vectors beyond RDP. I, I don't get your question. Like, do you feel that there's going to be other vectors to, to attack? Oh, the, uh, other vectors, right? right. I mean, there is a lot of vectors. Look, I mean, uh, it can be ransomware, it can be something else to extract. I have another demo here, but we don't have a time. Uh, around 40 gigabytes of screenshots. So what they were doing, they were doing a remote desktop and doing screenshot every single second of the victims. And I have the data. It was huge. Uh, but that was mostly, uh, you know, I receive every day, hey, I have your naked pictures, you need to pay something. You know, and the guy is sending again and again and again. This is not new, okay? But right now with the ransomware, they are doing massively. But I can tell you six years ago, with a remote desktop, 
the, what you are telling me right now, he was doing a malware, remote desktop, opening a connection, doing just screenshots every second, every second, and then building a movie from the screenshots, okay? And then you can drop the movie, or whatever it is, and then you can play, and you can see what he's doing for one hour, okay? So, I mean, I hope that this answers your question, yeah. or maybe yeah. we can catch up later. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay then, last thing. Today we have a threat hunting workshop, so you guys can use this real stuff with your own hands and you can become a threat hunter, so if you like you can join me, yes? Have you made any profiling on the kind of the servers that the CNC are placed to? For example, if there are rogue VPS or something like that? What to provide? What kind of uh, servers are the CNC oh, servers? Oh, look, I mean... <laughs> Night, I mean, I don't want to. I don't. I don't know the exact statistics. Nobody is keeping some numbers for this, but I think that around more than ninety percent is uh, hacked servers. Okay, so they don't buy. That's one thing. The second thing is for phishing attacks, they always prefer shared hosting. Okay, because look, if I hack a shared host web server, I'm going to hack all the domains under it, right? So I I have one shot, and I can have multiple. They don't go to the dedicated. Hostings, because if they hack a dedicated hosting server, right, then they're going to have one domain. But if it's a water holding attack, then they're going to go mostly on the dedicated web servers, okay, to deliver a water holding attack because it's more, let's say, more safe, right? You go, like, I don't know, uh, to do drop some open source software, right, and you believe to the website, but if it's under the water holding attack, and if someone hacked that one, then you trust to hack the website, okay? So, they use VPSs most of the time. They use shared hosts most of the time. And right now, you know, uh, yeah, with the Tor right now, they started using Tor. We can we see a lot of all the transaction background. So the payload, okay, dropper can came at, from everywhere. The payload is coming always from their short time of web. So what they do, they send you a dropper, right? Dropper zero days, so it's infect your machine, no AV, no nothing, right? And what they do to avoid sandboxing. So if you cache the dropper. Doesn't matter if it's coming from email, you catch the dropper, you put on the sandbox, right? You execute a malware and then there is a post or get communication to IP address which doesn't exist. What your sandbox is going to do? Your sandbox cannot decide if that is malicious or not, right? And what they do, your sandbox is going to score it like a low. Hey, there was a, some post or get, but there was no. And then what they are doing, after two days, they are pulling up the CNC server up. <laughs> and that piece of dropper has a heartbeat. It's checking if it's on or off. And when he's reaching out there, he's dropping the payload and game over. Your sandbox is the, uh, uh, bypassed and your AV is bypassed. It's simple. Okay? So, yeah, there is a lot of ways. We can, we can speak this also later. I mean, a lot of, a lot of ways. Or like, uh, yeah, wanna cry the kill switch, right? What do you think, guys? What, what, what was the kill switch used for? Okay, so two options: to control the spread or to evade sandbox. What do you think? Okay, how you can evade sandbox with a kill switch? So let me tell you something. Sandboxes by the default. They are running Apache DNS or FakeNet on their own host. So every single request, you're going to receive like a 200 found. So it doesn't matter if you write a random.com, it will rep replay like a 200, okay? And you tell to your malware, hey, if you are going to www.abcd1234, a domain which doesn't exist, and if you receive 200, you're on the sandbox, don't do anything. <laughs> Make sense? So, I mean, somebody thinks that the ransomware WannaCry uh, kill switch was used for the spreading control. Somebody thinks that it was used for the sandbox evade. Only the guy who built, only he knows. We can only uh, guess right now. Yep. Okay, so do you have any suggestions or proposal how to defend ourselves from some uh, those kinds of attacks? So look, defensive debt is number one, right? I mean, we need to, we need to stick on defense and debt, we need to invest in defense and debt, even if it's broken, right? Right now, there is a huge shift on the market for the ADR platforms, you can check them, okay? And remember one thing, uh, intelligence platforms, external intelligence, right? 
you can buy all of them. <laughs> external threat intelligence will not help you against the zero-day malware attacks and unknown attacks. Who's going to attack you with a known bad malware, right? Come on, guys. So, I mean, uh, there is some hype right now. You know, I remember like an action, action, action. Everybody was buying action. Now everybody is buying uh, threat intelligence. That's the one thing. The second thing is that there is some non-logical race in the AV market right now. The catch rate. Who is catching more malware? Don't buy a cybersecurity product by doing a catch rate because that's not real, okay? Because if you have a, let's say that you have a customer, I don't know, bank number one, right? And they use McAfee for AV, right? I prepare a zero-day malware, I attack them, McAfee sample sketches, hey, I have a signature, right? Is this making a McAfee better than Symantec? No, because McAfee was on that bank, right? What will happen if I'm attacking now second bank where Symantec is installed, right? Symantec catch my malware, sandboxing, hey, we catch the malware. Is McAfee bad? Again, so this kind of races are not real, okay? You cannot race malware, uh, catch, so focus on more behave, focus on sandbox and stuff like that rather than catch rates. So uh, companies, what they do regarding the AV, they bought uh, as many as they can and they put uh, McAfee, Symantec, uh, and CL. So if the pass is the first one, uh, they will try to cut the second one, and so on. But they all have the same um, uh, fingerprints and the same signature, so yep. they will never cut, if they buy every AV product in the world, they will never cut uh, a new malware. I mean, that's, that's exactly what I, what what you are telling me, I just tell you the same, right? So basically, uh, like virus total, right? They have just static checks. You, you push a shot of 56, they check on their blacklist, and they say, yeah, this is detected, this is not. How easy is to change shot of 56? Just echo a couple of bytes inside, and you have a new shot of 56, okay? <laughs> I mean, yeah, this, this cat and the mouse can be, can be, well, let's put it this way. The, the cat and the mouse with the shot of 56, or file disposition lookups, we call them file disposition, right? cannot be done by threat intelligence. You still need a sandboxing, behave indicators, uh, exploit prevention engine, heuristic engine, right? And system protections engines are really, really important, you know? Let me tell you something about the Mimikas, right? You know, I mean, it's pain in ass right now, right? Mimikas everywhere. Why? Because we are trying to block Mimikas. No, we need to block the processes that Mimikas is using to leverage his job, okay? So if we do that, then Mimikas is gone, right? So again, then Mimica needs to find another way, right, to bypass. So, because you can take, you can compile your own uh, malware, right, and you have a new shot to 56 and everything is bypassed. Any other questions? Okay then, thanks for listening to me, see you.